namo myo ho renge kyo namo myo ho renge kyo wow i need a shave okay you all know my fondness for shaving <laughs> letter to shomitsu bowl With regard to the Mahavarachana Sutra, Shan Wu Wei, Pu Kung, and Ching Kang Chi declared that the principle of the Mahavarachana Sutra is the same as the principle of the Lotus Sutra. But in the matter of mudras and mantras, the Lotus Sutra is inferior. <clears throat> well, of course it is, because mudras and mantras of all sorts are provisional earlier teachings that are no longer relevant. They are no longer effective. They certainly don't apply to the latter day or the time period you and I live in for efficacy of any sort to instantiate our Buddha-ness immediately in this life. They're, they're earlier teachings, mudras. Mudras are hand positions and mantras are personal invocations. Uh, we have the ultimate invocation, Myoho Renge Kyo. Our own Buddhahood is instantiated. <clears throat> so to say the Mahavarachana Sutra is superior to the Lotus is just, it's either willingly ignorant for political reasons or just dumb. Vain usually. Is the answer there. On the other hand, the monks Ling Shu, Quang Xu, or Xu, and Wei Chuang declared that the Mahavarachana Sutra cannot compare to the Flower Garland, Lotus, or Nirvana Sutra, but is merely one of the sutras of the correct and equal period. Correct. The great teacher Kobo of Japan states, quote, The Lotus Sutra is inferior even to the Flower Garland Sutra. And so, of course, it cannot compare with the Mahavarachana Sutra. He also says, quote, The Lotus Sutra was preached by Shakyamuni, while the Mahavarachana Sutra was preached by the thus come one Mahavarachana. And as you and I both know, all other Buddhas are emanations of, to use the translation words, or in other words, from the imagination of Shakyamuni Buddha, the instantiated human as Buddha. There is only one historical Buddha, that is. These sutras were thus thought, uh, taught by two different Buddhas. In addition, the Thus Come One Shakyamuni is a mere messenger of the Thus Come One Mahavarachana. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he preached the exoteric doctrines, which represent no more than the first step toward the esoteric doctrines. It's amazing, isn't it, how things can get turned on their head simply by political will and how easily those who were illiterate, really, uh, the masses were not, there were no, there was no public schooling. Uh, it was the elite uh, of the priesthood and sometimes the elite of government, uh, not always, who were responsible for maintaining language, grammar, written documents. Uh, even <clears throat> in the time of Shakyamuni himself, uh, this was done orally. Um, so the rest of the masses were just peasants. They're just serfs, uh, obviously a huge power dynamic at work there. So if somebody wanted to take over who was in that elite class, they could say, well, I'll say anything. And everyone will go, oh, especially if it's different, he must be right. You know, it's an authoritarian mindset. And again, he states, Quote, the Buddha of the lifespan chapter, which is the heart of the Lotus Sutra, is a Buddha in terms of the exoteric teachings, but from the point of view of the esoteric teachings, he is no more than a common mortal who is bound by and entangled in illusions and desire. 
Oh, that's that's almost that's hard for me to read. The, the the entire the entire practice the entire teachings of Buddhism are possible. They exist solely because this man Siddhartha Gautama, a human like you and I, showed that you can attain perfect enlightenment while in this life as this human that you are. That is the whole premise of Buddhism, that Buddhahood is available to all of us right now without changing forms, without afterlife or before life, without any of those uh, mystical, magical thinkings, you and I in our present form can invoke and instantiate our Buddha-ness, our Buddha-nature, our Buddha-mind. That's the whole point. And here this guy, some great teacher, says that that very thing is what limits Shakyamuni is just a guy living in the delusions like you and I. Yeah, and he became Buddha, which is what you pretend to practice. How, how flipped? I don't even understand how that's logical to a person who says it, especially somebody who's supposed to be educated and knowledgeable in the practice of Buddhism. Complete, completely missing the point. All right, going on. I, Nichiren, after pondering the matter, have this to say. The Mahavaranchana Sutra is one of the newer translations and was transmitted to China by the Tripitaka master Shan Wu Wei of India in the reign of Emperor Tsuan Tsung of the Tang in the fourth year of the Kaiyuan era, 716. The Lotus Sutra is one of the older translations transmitted to China by the Tripitaka master Kumarajiva in the time of the latter Qin dynasty, 384 to 417. The two are separated by an interval of more than 300 years. More than a hundred years after the Lotus Sutra was brought to China, the great teacher Tendai Chiche established in the realm of doctrinal studies the classification of the five periods and the four teachings. He refuted the doctrinal interpretations put forward by the scholars of the preceding 500 years or more, and through his practice of meditation, awakened to the truth of the 3,000 realms in a single thought moment. Of life, realizing for the first time the principle of the Lotus Sutra. The three treatises school that had preceded the great teacher Tendai and the Dharma characteristic school that appeared after his time both taught the doctrine of the eight worlds, but they made no mention of the ten worlds. So their schools could not possibly have established the doctrine of the 3,000 realms in a single thought moment of life. The Flower Garland School had its beginnings among the various teachings of northern and southern China before Tendai's advent. These teachers declared that the Flower Garland Sutra was superior to the Lotus Sutra, but at that time they did not refer to themselves as the Flower Garland School. It was the Dharma teachers Fa Tsang and Cheng Quang, men of the reign of Empress Wu, the consort of Emperor Gao Tsung of the Tang, who first began using the term Flower Garland School. This school, in its doctrinal interpretations, posits the five teachings and, in its meditative practices, sets forth the principles of the Ten Mysteries and the Six Forms. All these teachings appear to be extremely impressive, and one might think that by means of them, Chang Quan would have been able to refute the teachings of Tendai. But in fact, what Chang Quan did was to borrow Tendai's doctrine of the 3,000 realms in a single thought moment of life and define it as the true intent of the passage in the Flower Garland Sutra that reads, quote, The mind is like a skilled painter. We might say, then, that the Flower Garland School was actually defeated by Tendai, or perhaps we should say that it was guilty of stealing the doctrine of the 3,000 realms in a single moment of thought, uh, thought moment of life. 
Chen Quan was, to be sure, a strict observer of the precepts. He did not violate a single precept of either the Mahayana or Hinayana codes in any way. And yet, he stole the doctrine of the Three Thousand Realms in a single thought moment of life, a fact that ought to be spoken of widely. Whether or not the term true word school was used in India is a matter of serious doubt. It may simply be that because there is a group of sutras known as the true word sutras, Shan Wu Wei and others affixed the term school to the teachings based on these sutras when they introduced them to China. One should be well aware of this point. In other words, there was no there was no specific school of Buddhism called the True Word. This was just something made up by these uh, travelers, the elite travelers of India, m going to China and then introducing it as their own school. Um, th there's so much drama and intrigue and political maneuvering around the movement of Buddhism throughout the Asian world. Um, and now into the West with uh, uh, these groups claiming that it's somehow Aladdin's lamp to chant to uh, a Gohonzon, a mandala of Gohonzon. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing sometimes to me that Buddhism continues to flourish. Uh, although, you know, with a lot of really terrible cause making on the part of organizations and individuals who simply want to manipulate people for their own gain. Um, it's, it's very, very, very sad that we're dealing with so much of that in our age, but it's been there all along, right? Uh, that's just the human creature, the greed, anger, and foolishness of human beings. So we would do well to see right through it. Thank goodness we have guidance of Nitrin to help us with that task. Let's continue. In particular, one should note that when Shan Wu Wei came to judge the relative merits of the Lotus Sutra and the Mahavarachana Sutra, he set forth the interpretation that the two are equal in principle, but the latter is superior in terms of practice. And that's solely based on this whole thing with hand positions. You know, I've said it before, the religions of uh, man have been so obsessed with the body, this body, everything from Christianity to Muslim to uh, Jewish, um, uh, the, they're cults of the body, all of them, all the rituals pertain to the body. So to hear that there's a Buddhist sect, I would say non-Buddhist, but a sect out there that uses Buddhism and has all of these body and hand positions as its practice, it's, to me, it's, it's simply not Buddhism. You know, it's still this obsession with things and, and, and humanness. That's not Buddhism. Buddhism is an, a liberation from exactly that. So it's not a little bit wrong. It's completely counter to what Buddhism is about. I know I've, I've been harping on this lately, but it's really important, especially in this latter age where everything is about possession, obsession, having, new. I've got a new this. Right to the point of our own bodies, we. I got a new face. I got a new eyelid. I got it. You, you get it. It's, it's upsetting to me. So sorry if I'm harping. He set forth the interpretation that the two are equal. By this, he meant that although the principle of the three thousand realms in a single thought moment of life is the same in both the Lotus and the Mahavarachana Sutras. The Lotus Sutra contains no mention of mudras and mantras and is therefore inferior 
to the Mahavarachana Sutra in terms of the practices to be carried out. It's like he didn't even read the Lotus Sutra. It's very clear in there. There's the 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 the, the, the preacher chapter, the 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 benefits chapter, the the. Uh, uh, I mean, there are several chapters in the Lotus Sutra that are directly about how to practice Namu Myoho Rengekyo. That may not be immediately apparent, but I think anyone t who casually reads the Lotus Sutra will see that the Lotus Sutra is about the Lotus Sutra, and it's about how the benefits are, are manifest by whether the... Um, Reading, embracing, copying, uh, uh, spreading. Uh, I know I'm missing something. But I mean, literally, how to practice. So long as it lacks actual descriptions of formulas for practice, one cannot say that it represents the esoteric teachings in both theory and practice. Nowadays, the people of Japan and many scholars of different schools subscribe to this opinion of Shan Wu Wei, including even the scholars of the Tendai school. How that happened. Oh. Who should be the last to do so? Thank you, Nitrin. In this regard, they are just like the adherents of the other schools who, although jealous of the Nembutsu believers, have all begun uh, themselves to call out the name of Amida and have completely abandoned the particular object of devotion revered in their own schools. So the Tendai bunks have all sunk to the level of true word believers. And this just goes to show you how authoritarian regimes work. Well, it's a popularity contest. Uh, if you want to be influential in society, in other words, have power, then what you do is ingratiate the greatest masses you can and go along with whatever's popular not correct because oftentimes correction is painful right because somebody has to ultimately admit, admit that they're wrong how is that a bad thing our whole species could not have advanced if all we did was whine about not being correct not being correct is an opportunity to learn more and surpass even what is thought to be correct at the time. Isn't that the way our species advances? Not so here. I am very suspicious of the logic underlying Shan Wu Wei's argument, of course. This Tripitaka master, Shan Wu Wei, declares that the Lotus Sutra and the Mahavarachana sutra are equal in principle but that the latter is superior in terms of practice he is taking the doctrine of three thousand realms in a single uh, thought moment of life first enunciated by the great teacher tendai reading it into the mahavarachana sutra and on that basis arbitrarily declaring that the two sutras are alike but should we accept such an assertion for example, long ago, Hitomaro composed a poem that reads, How I think of it, dim, dim in the morning mist, of Akashi Bay, that boat moving out of sight beyond the islands. Kino Shikubo, Minamoto no Shitago, and others have praised this poem, declaring it to be the father and mother of poetry. Now suppose someone should announce that he had composed a poem and without charging, uh, changing a single syllable should proceed to recite it, this poem by Hitomaro and then boast that his talent was in no way inferior to that of Hitomaro. Would anyone be likely to agree with his claim? Uneducated people such as mountain folk and fishermen might just possibly do so. So Nietzsche is spelling out exactly what I've been describing. Uh, it's a societal problem of education, right? Where are we time-wise? Oh, we're great. This principle of the 3,000 realms in a single thought moment of life that was first put forward by the great teacher Tendai is the father and mother of the Buddhas. Yet, more than a hundred years later, the Tripitaka master Shan Wu Wei stole this doctrine and proceeded to declare in his writings 
that the Mahavana Chana Sutra and the Lotus Sutra are equal in principle because it was applying the 3,000 realms to the Mahavarachana, which was never there. And that the principle that they had in common was this one of 3,000 realms in a single moment of thought, or a thought moment in life. Should any person of understanding give credence to such a claim? No, of course not. If you're educated, if you're a student of Buddhism and you read through the actual sutras, uh, this becomes a blatant lie, it becomes very obvious. But if you don't even know how to read or write, and somebody who does tells you so, aren't you inclined to believe it? I mean, who are you to challenge it, right? Because you just don't know. And you don't have the mechanism to know. So these people, in their position of responsibility, they just got greedy for power, for money, for fame, for popularity, whatever. And so they, they figured they could say whatever they want and the foolish people, uneducated people, would just, oh, let's go along. He further asserts that the Mahavanachana Sutra is superior in terms of practice because the Lotus Sutra contains no mention of Buddha's mudras and mantras. Now, is he speaking of the relative worth of the Sanskrit versions of the Mahavanachana and the Lotus Sutras? Or is he speaking of the relative worth of the Chinese versions of these two sutras? Now this touches on a subject that I often uh, describe to you as uh, a suspect. And that this is why the scholarship of Buddhism, like Nichiren, Tendai, uh, Nagarjuna, so on and so forth, Miao is so important to Buddhism. Because translations can bury in them depending on who translates them and who interprets those translations um, agendas can be pushed into translations and muddy the waters so it's up to good actors as it were uh, scholars um, to met this out and weed out the uh, the improprieties so this is what Nichiren is talking about here. The Tripitaka Master Pukung's translation of the rituals, rules and rituals based on the Lotus Sutra indicate that the Lotus Sutra does in fact contain mudras and mantras. Similarly, the translations of the Benevolent King's Sutra by Kumara Jiva contains no mudras or mantras, but a later translation of the same sutra by Pukung does contain mudras and mantras, Hmm. So you might wonder sometimes when you read that we use Kumara Jiva's translation. Uh, when I first heard that, I thought, oh, well, how many translations are there? And why do you, because the organization I was studying with at the time had so many arrogant statements uh, that were incorrect. When they said that to me, I thought I was more curious about the other translations, to be honest. What did they bury in order to claim this one was first? And it took a decade of study from for myself to become convinced that now I understood why Kumara Jiva was such a scholar. Himself, I'd have to say, a bodhisattva, because he was not only interested in translating. He just didn't sit in a room and go, okay, next. Um, he was quite a researcher. And he went through many previous translations looking for authentic documents, some of which had been lost to time and which had been interpreted or uh, translated by other minor actors who just did parts and portions of the Lotus Sutra, certain chapters, and in fact changed the order of the chapter a few times, inserting some um, and taking others out that simply didn't belong, that obviously were inserted by others of lower uh, intent. And so uh, it would be more accurate to say that the translations of Kumara Jiva were not simply translations, but very high scholarship and research to uh, identify the core and meaningful chapters. I shouldn't say it that way because that sounds like a lot of editing. Uh, he edited out erroneous chapters and made sure that the sermons of the Lotus Sutra were not only 
properly represented in their proper order, but act in fact, the openings and closings sutras to the Lotus Sutra were uh, tremendous documents uh, to point to the correct uh, c construct of the entirety of the Lotus Sutra. Uh, I have a translation from H. Kern that is, uh, I'll say, missing a chapter because he was working from earlier documents, uh, even though that translation was done in the late 1800s. So, you know, scholarship is intensely important. Academic scholarship, true to um, uh, fact as possible, rather than being uh, agenda-driven assemblages to represent a certain teaching or a group of chapters and call them a Lotus Sutra when in fact uh, they're missing big chunks of information and maybe have other erroneous chunks of information pushed into them. Uh, this becomes obvious if you do study, right? If you study algebra really well, uh, to, in other words, well enough to be able to um, uh, apply yourself and apply uh, algebraic principles to logic, then if somebody throws in a chapter on spaghetti, it becomes very obvious to you that that's not algebra, right? I mean, it's that glaringly obvious. There's no subtleties here. It's very obvious. So this is why Kumara Jiva is the translation we use today, because it's overwhelmingly clear, and the scholarship is very intact. But it didn't just pop up on the radar, because it got handed by in a little note from desk to desk in uh, junior high school. It's because it was researched with precision, so you can rely on that. So I'm glad I got to say that because you may have the same questions I had, right? These various sutras, as they existed in India, no doubt, had a countless number of such practices associated with them. But because India and China are far apart, and it was difficult to transport everything, the sutras were abridged when they were brought to China. So things were left out. So the scholarship of Kumara Jiva is also about going back into Indian scholarship and finding uh, things that may have been left out, which were big clues and keys in getting the entirety of a, a, the writings, the sutra, um, correct and, and complete, right? Although the Lotus Sutra does not mention mudras and mantras, it has the merit of declaring that persons of the two vehicles can attain Buddhahood and even records the kalpas when this will happen, the lands where it will take place, and the names that they will bear when they become Buddhas. It also declares that Shakyamuni attained enlightenment in the distant past. Time without beginning, actually. The Mahavarachana Sutra may describe mudras and mantras, but it says nothing about the attainment of Buddhahood by those of the two vehicles or the Buddha's original enlightenment in the far distant past. Because it's a story. It's a story Shakyamuni made in order to teach certain concepts. Mahavarachana is not an actual Buddha. He's a Buddha, he's, he's a mental construct. Like, your Buddhahood, when you experience it, when you chant, think of it this way, when you chant Namo Myoho Geko to your mandala of Gohonzon, you fuse with it and you experience your Buddha mind. That tingling, detached awe of observation, that little archaic smile that comes over your face like a newborn child. And you feel that. What if you gave it a name? You know, call it uh, finally awake Buddha. That's your finally awake Buddha. That's your impression of your Buddha mind as you experience that in your human self. Boy, girl, man, woman, whoever you are. 
And that's, that's your Buddha name, finally awakened Buddha. Does that finally awakened Buddha supersede Shakyamuni? Of course not. There is no need for superseding. Buddha is Buddha. But the teacher and founder of this method to attain it is still always going to be Shakyamuni. He's the one who guided us to our finally awakened Buddha. Do you follow? And if you tell a story about your finally awakened Buddha and how you got there, that's great. Do that. That's a teaching. That's your teaching. It's your path. You're of innumerable paths. Your path is specific to your realization of your finally awakened Buddha. But the reason you got there was because of Shakyamuni's teachings. You didn't invent Buddhism. You simply realized your Buddha mind. Mahavarachana, just like Amida and all these other Buddhas, they are emanations of Shakyamuni. They are constructs Ma Shakyamuni used to teach the different mental pattern, patterns that one might encounter in attaining their Buddha mind. I hope that makes sense to you. Let me know if it doesn't uh, in the comments because I definitely want to make this point clear. If we compare this doctrine of attainment of Buddhahood by persons of the two vehicles with the matter of mudras and mantras, we will see that they are as far apart in importance as heaven and earth. In all the various sutras that the Buddha preached in the more than 40 years before the Lotus Sutra, persons of the two vehicles are described as rotten seeds that can never sprout. They are condemned not merely in wor a word or two, but in innumerable passages in sutra after sutra. In the Lotus Sutra, however, all these passages are refuted. It is proclaimed that persons of the two vehicles can, in fact, attain Buddhahood. There's, there's so many things that distinguish the Lotus Sutra from all previous teachings. This is why study is so important, because it's, it becomes so blatantly obvious that the ultimate practice of Buddhism is Myoho Renge Kyo, period, end of story. There's no challenges. If you read it, because now all of us are educated, we all know how to read and write, or at very least, we know how to pay attention when somebody's talking to us. And this, again, is why study is so important. If all you do is study one document, you will never know its place in the canon. Any amount, you read two, three, or four other sutras, and just that will point you to the Lotus Sutra. And when you reread the Lotus Sutra after you've done that, oh, oh, I know where that's from. Oh, I get that. Oh, wow, this goes way beyond what that said. It, it becomes so obvious. Right? It's like going to a cupboard and making peanut butter jelly sandwiches, and then you encounter a master chef. And you just go, is the master chef on the same level as peanut butter and jelly? All right. As for mudras and mantras, where in any sutra has one ever encountered a passage condemning them? And since they are, have never been condemned, the Mahavarachana Sutra, as with many other sutras, does not avoid mentioning mudras and mantras and therefore teaches them. These are leftovers from India, from Hinduism, from yoga, from other practices that are really Indian cultural practices. They're really not Buddhism. They don't belong in sutras at all. Although they may have been discussed because, as you know, Shakyamuni talked to the capacity of the people of his time in India. 
A mudra is a gesture made with the hand. But if the hand does not become Buddha, how can mudras made with the hand lead one to Buddhahood? <laughs> Good point. A mantra is a motion made with the mouth. But if the mouth does not become Buddha, how can mantras made with the mouth lead one to Buddhahood? Interesting, I hadn't heard it like that. If the persons of the two vehicles do not encounter the Lotus Sutra, then even though they may perform the mudras and mantras of the 1,200 or more honored ones for innumerable kalpas, they will never attain Buddhahood in body, mouth, or mind. Interesting, they mentions body there, right? One who would declare as superior a text that contains no mention of the fact that the persons of the two vehicles can attain Buddhahood, though this is a highly superior teaching, but that instead describes mudras and mantras, though these are matters of inferior significance, must be a thief in terms of the principle and a non-Buddhist who regards inferior things as superior in terms of practice. Well, there it is, exactly what I'm saying. It's not Buddhism. Because he committed this error, Shan Wu Wei was censured by Yama. In other words, earthly existence. The, the world did not accept his uh, heinous uh, self-aggrandizement, really. Yama is here, he calls it the Lord of Hell. In other words, the lower functions of our earthly existence, right? Later, he repented of, of it, revered the great teacher Tendai, and put his resolute mind and conviction in the Lotus Sutra. So he escaped the path of evil negative influence. Yeah, as you'll recall, he became a servant of Tendai to uh, basically beg forgiveness of his own life for being such an arrogant fool. The Buddha's original enlightenment in the far distant past is not even hinted at in the Mahavarajana Sutra. And yet this original enlightenment is the source of all Buddhas. Thus, if we take the vast ocean as a symbol of the Buddha's original enlightenment in the distant past, then the fish and the birds that inhabit it are comparable to the 1,200 and more honored ones of the true word teachings. Without the revelation of the Buddha's enlightenment countless ages ago, the 1,200 and more honored ones would become like so many bits of floating weed and lack any root, or like the nighttime dew that lasts only until sun rises. So understand when Nichiren talks about original enlightenment and... Uh, uh, who's a contemporary scholar? Uh, Joss, Jock, Jacqueline? Jacqueline Stone uh, has uh, written books, uh, excellent books, on the original enlightenment uh, of the medieval times in Japanese Buddhism. But this is a key subject because this is the lifespan chapter Nietzsche is talking about. And when he talks about original enlightenment, what he's really stating is that the state of Buddhahood is a pre-existing condition of the life process. In other words, the clear perception of the process of life is contained within the process of life. How could it not be? But as we precipitate or manifest or instantiate as human in human form in this samsaric mind, we view everything that we're discovering and oh, because everything that motivates, if you study the Nidana, it's all about manifesting from craving, from having a thought moment to being able to perceive that thought moment. That's like an initial step. Perceiving that thought moment, one then manufactures a desire to experience that thought moment. That is the beginning process of becoming a human being. So the very beginning process of being human, being a tree, being a universe, comes from 
that desire to experience what one thinks. Makes infinite sense, doesn't it? So obviously, awareness of that is Buddha mind. It's been there all along. It's part and parcel of the process. Ironically, the process itself creates an experiential mental consciousness that's so preoccupied with continuing that craving and, and craving and instantiation that it forgets all about what motivated it in the first place. That is what attaining Buddhahood is about becoming that perceiver of worlds becoming the perceiver of the process of life itself how amazing so this is what Nietzsche is trying to describe here this vast ocean of original enlightenment is the everythingness of everything, right? How can anything within that process claim to be the original? It wouldn't exist were it not for the original. I keep coming back to this argument, right? People of the Tendai school fail to understand this matter and thus allow themselves to be deceived by the true word teachers and the true word teachers themselves unaware that their own school is an error, go on vainly accumulating distorted ideas that can only lead to the evil paths. Suffering. The Reverend Kukai not only failed to understand this principle, but in addition borrowed a false interpretation of the Flower Garland School that had already been refuted in the past and adopted the erroneous view that the Lotus Sutra is inferior even to the Flower Garland Sutra, the first teaching that Shakyamuni ever uh, had after his enlightenment. This is like talking about the length of turtles' fur or the existence of rabbits' horns. Since there is no fur on a turtle's shell, how can one argue over its length? Since there are no horns on a rabbit's head, how can one debate their existence? All right, getting a little bit long here. So he's about to go into question and answer. Let's read this last paragraph, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into the question and answer section in the next video when we close this out. Even someone like Shine Wu Wei, who declared that the Lotus Sutra and the Mahavarachana Sutra are the same in principle, could not escape the censure of Yama. How then can someone who says that the Flower Garland Sutra is inferior to the Mahavarachana Sutra and that the Lotus Sutra is in turn inferior to the Flower Garland Sutra escape the charge of slandering the correct teaching? Though the individuals involved may differ, the slander is the same. From this we can discern the reason why Kukai's principal disciple, the administrator of monks Kakinomoto no Ki, turned into a blue demon. Unless Kukai has repented of his mistaken opinions and rectified them, he no doubt still remains in the evil paths. What then will be the fate of his followers? And then we start into the question and answer period. So. This is good. I haven't, um, it's been a long, long time since I've read this Go Show and I, I, um, I'm refreshed in, uh, in reading it here. Uh, I can see where a lot of my insights um, came directly from Nitrin's teaching. So, interesting. Let, just for a minute, let's find out who uh, Shino, uh, Shimitsubo is. This is obviously a teaching letter. Uh, helping him to be a better communicator and propagator of uh, Buddhism. And Nichiren does this a lot. 
This letter was written in Minobu, 1277. Uh, thought uh, Shomitsubo thought to be one of Nichiren Shonen's disciples living in Sechoji, which is where Nichiren was born. Uh, not Sechoji, uh, sorry, that's uh, where he started his studies. Uh, Sechoji Temple in the province of Awa. Uh, another opinion regards Shomitsubo as a true word priest living near Sechi, uh, Sechijo, Sechoji, who looked up to Nichiren. Detailed information about Shimizubo is lacking, but it appears that he was a monk of Seshoji Temple who had become Nichiren's follower and occasionally sought his instruction. The chief monk of Seshoji at the time is thought to have been Jokenbo, some sources say uh, Jijobo, a uh, monk senior to Nichiren who had uh, later taken resolute mind and conviction in his teachings. In another letter written to his chief monk, Nichiren urges him to consult with Shumitsubo about any difficulties confronting the temple and describes Shumitsubo as knowledgeable in worldly affairs. So, Shumitsubo, uh, and, and, reach, and we have read previous uh, Gosho, previous letters that Nichiren has written for these uh, monks at this temple because of his uh, filial relationship with the temple um, as one of his uh, beginnings of scholarship and as a very young uh, student of Buddhism. Um, so Shimitsubo, obviously we don't know exactly who it was, but we're quite certain was a monk involved with Seshoji Temple. So, um, But it's it's it makes perfect sense because as I said, this letter is obviously a letter of uh, scholarship uh, to help sort out the matter of what's going on in Japan at that time with these vying schools and um, and the relative uh, uh, propagation of Lotus Sutra. So, with that, thank you for being here. I appreciate uh, so much your participation. I hope your practice is strong and your health is well. And uh, don't forget, you can download all of these as podcasts at the Buddhahood Podcast. Um, and until the next one, uh, stay well, stay strong, and thank you again. I'm very grateful for your support and um, scholarship. Namo Bye-bye for now.